Paul to show us where we're beginning, John. I've got two New Testament passages I want to read to you before I get to where we're going to put our anchor for the day. So you have to hang with me and we'll get there. But I want you to hear these scriptures before we uh, get into Matthew 5. James 4 is the first. And you can note this, you can save this for later, but I want you to see how God's word ties together to bring us the message today. This is James, by all accounts, the biological brother of Jesus, an initial skeptic who later became a Christian. He gave us this New Testament letter through the Holy Spirit. He says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Now listen to this language. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched and mourn. Catch that part. Mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will exalt you. You catch the language in James, don't you? Rather than rejoice, the attention is drawn to unclean hands, sin, then the need to seek purity, to mourn and weep over what has been made unclean. The next passage that I want to pair up is very short from Peter, 1 Peter 5, 5-6. through 6. This is it. This is not James. This is another man. This is someone who knew James well, Peter. He says, Likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. I'm in trouble. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another, regardless of age or status. Or here it is. God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. James says, humble yourselves under the hand of God. Peter says, God opposes the proud, but grace is the humble. Peter goes on to echo James. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time, he may exalt you. Now, how about that? James, humble yourselves. Peter, humble yourselves. What would Jesus say? Something that may seem detached, but let's go there. Again, we're at the Sermon on the Mount. This is our passage mainly for the day. I'll refer back to the other two occasionally. Seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Here it is. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. We need to pray before we go further. God, give my word the power from the Holy Spirit and inspiration to speak what is true, speak what is helpful. God, give us vision together as a church for the present day that we're in and for the future that you would call us into should there be a delay any further in the return of Jesus that we're here. Lord, help us to come away from this with a greater sense of thankfulness for being so loved by you. Help us, Lord, not to miss that on this rainy Sunday morning. There's something that rains down on us harder than water and storm, and that's the grace and the love of our Heavenly Father. Help us, God, to consider in our lives what it might mean for Jesus to tell us we are blessed with poor spirit and we are blessed when mourning. This is unusual to think about this in this way. Our world, and we're part of it, we love to be quickly moved and distracted from sad things and sad events. And I pray, Father, that we wouldn't be the kind of people who are morbid and constantly in unnecessary gloom, but that we would get the spiritual blessing and the benefit of being the sort of people described here in Matthew's Gospel. Lift Jesus high. He lives. He calls. He cleanses. He saves. To our people who couldn't be here this morning who aren't well, I just know the two by the name of Ed and Mark. God, would you work fast powerfully to bring them through whatever it is they're dealing with that they've got on. And would you guard and protect them and move forward? And those of us here under that same protection from unnecessary pains, things of the world we wish we didn't have to live with. Don't turn our eyes on you, Lord Jesus. Amen. Well, to begin with, we're back into the attitudes. This list is peculiar to Matthew's gospel. He 
because there's not a list like it in the rest of the Bible. Luke has a little bit of it. Luke's list is much shorter. And Luke, funny enough, gives us some blessed be, blessed be, but then he goes on and he kind of gives us some woe to you, woe to you. You can hear Luke in Luke 6, verse 20. Jesus gives, uh, blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you shall be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you shall laugh. Blessed are you, and, and then he goes on about people who hate you and exclude you and treat you poorly because of me. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. That's Luke. So Luke's got four, and then Luke turns around like a good Baptist pastor and gives four darn yous, some woes. He says, woe to you who are rich, you've got your consolation. Woe to you who are full, because you, for you shall eventually be hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, you're going to mourn and weep. Woe to you when people speak well of you, for their fathers did the same to the false prophets. So that's the only other place in the Bible that kind of sounds like this. Matthew is unique in this list. Matthew gives us what, what comes to be about 13 verses of material, really 12 verses of material to work with in the Beatitudes. We call them Beatitudes because the Latin Beatitude just means the blessing, the blessing, the one who is blessed. And how about that? How about you pray that God blesses you? You ever do that? Yeah. You ever pray, God, would you just bless my family, my mom, my dad, my brother, my sister, and me? And what are we thinking is going to happen? All the things we already want to have happen, right? Why don't, I, why don't I have myself a good dad? Nothing wrong with that wish. Why don't I have myself a good family visit? Maybe the blessing comes because your loved one is suddenly in the hospital and the blessing looks different. It's just, let's just get up out of bed. Just want to see him walk out. That, that'd be good enough. Or maybe there's an announcement that a new baby is on the way. Would you bless with a safe delivery and a baby, all the things that come there. So we shape our expectation of blessing based on the circumstance, and then we go and we ask God for that. And that's fine. Nothing wrong with that. But Jesus, when he begins to teach his disciples, as it says here, he's on the mount, he opened up his mouth, and he talked, and his disciples have come to him. We can assume the crowds are still there, but this message is the immediate crowd is disciples. The rest can hear, and the application is there. They can, they can start to live like this too. They can become other disciples. But Jesus doesn't begin by saying, blessed are you when your hopes and expectations are met. He rather says something kind of strange. It'd be as if the pastor got up in front of the crowd on a Sunday morning and said, blessed are you when you fail like nothing. He says, blessed are the poor in spirit. But theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The poor in spirit. My point for you today between the first two Beatitudes, which will be my emphasis. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. My point to you today is this. God's kingdom and God's comfort are reserved for those who recognize their desperate need for grace. You want the kingdom, you want comfort, you've got to come to God just as you are without one. But that kind of love was shed for them. We are not going to be like the people Jesus will mention later in Matthew 7, who say, Lord, I've done quite a bit for you on earth. You could add up the list, and it's been miraculous, God, what I've done for you here. I have been a miracle man and a demon exorcist. I've been, I've been real powerful down here in your name. And Jesus would say, The spectacle is not what I was after, friend, it was the relationship. Say the part we probably never do. So, we are looking at a peculiar kind of relationship to God that is defined by beginning it poor in spirit. When you read the Beatitudes, you see things that probably are going to challenge you. You might say, I come short here. I look at this list and I'll be honest with you. Some of them stand out to me as more strengths or natural inclinations than others. Some of you are gifted with the gift of mercy. You are able to bear with people who are hard to deal with. And you can carry the patient presence and smile of God forward in your relationships. Some were more efficiency driven. And the need to be merciful can come with, with uh, a lot of frustration in our lives. 
Others of us love to go into challenges and conflict situations and see what we can do. So we run into Matthew 5, 9 that says, blessed are the peacemakers. And we say, well, sometimes you need to get in a fight. Right? Not me. No. I'm a peacemaker. I'm a peacemaker chief, as far as I know. Get me out of the controversy. Get me out of the fight. But you know what? Sometimes it's true. you got to wear the armor of God because the day of fight is comes. You can't always back down and hide. Quite frankly, as a matter of fact, I think the spiritual condition of our day and time demands more of a Joshua mentality. Be strong and courageous. The Lord goes with you. So the Beatitudes have nothing to do with our personality type. You ever take one of those personality type tests or been, been around somebody who's telling you about theirs? Myers-Briggs, you ever heard of that one? In the professional world, they give you the Myers-Briggs type indicator. You get a four-letter combination that explains your psychology and why you think this way and how it might be. A, how you might be when you're dating or married. How you might be when you have kids. How you might be when, if you were to work this type of job or go to this type of school. I mean, I tell you, my type is the ENFJ. It stands for extroverted, intuitive, feeling, and judging. I don't know about all that, but when I went and read the quick shot of what a DNFJ is like, I did kind of feel like somebody was scanning the front and back of my brain. It says we tend to work better based on our convictions than on how much money we make. We tend to want to lead others into a brighter future even if they're not ready to take the steps. There's another type that my wife got uh, into another another personality test. You might have heard this. This seems fashionable among young ladies. It's called the Enneagram. It's a nine. It means the nine-sided type. It's one of nine. It calls me the peacemaker. Top nine. But it's our peacemaker. So this, mm. so this has nothing to do with that, though. Those are kind of fun. Those are quirky. Those are kind of neat. If you're into leadership or relationships or whatever, you just want to take a closer look at what some study folks might say about your type, that's fine. Nothing wrong with that. But that's not what the Beatitudes are. The Beatitudes are to be really a progressive building upon itself way to identify the disciples of Jesus. The, these traits, these characteristics should be our daily experience in some manner. Not every day are we going to mourn as other days. But there should be certain spiritual, personal realities that as we come before God, we carry that before God, and we say, Lord, this has broken my heart, but here I am to offer it to you and to have you to help me and deal with this thing that I'm mourning over. It should be that every day we work from a merciful disposition. It should be that every day there's a meekness of God's. It should be that we have a hungering and a thirsting for the rightness, the goodness, the righteousness of God. Not every day will you be persecuted, perhaps. Maybe not directly. But that's in there too. And so we come to these, and what I want you to understand is it's not like some of us are going to only have one or the other or another or another. But in the course of a normal, growing, maturing believer's life, we should experience these blessed states and the results of them. If you're looking in your Bible at Matthew 5, you'll see this. In verse 3, and then in verse 10, those two verses have the same reward stated. To the poor in spirit and to the righteous persecuted, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Same reward. Present tense. Not there's going to be the kingdom of heaven. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. For the rest of them, it's they shall. So we're looking in the future. And I, I would submit to you that these they shalls are things that we might get a taste of in this life. Perhaps a mouthful of it from God. They shall be comforted. But I'm going to go ahead and argue, at least based on the meek shall inherit the earth, that some of this stuff is really reserved for the far future where God brings about the full result of recreating heaven and earth. And then he gives to us, his people, the kingdom in full. They say that Adam was created to be like a vice royal presence on the earth. 
to represent the reign and rule of God. They say that because it's typical in ancient times that the king who would want to proclaim, this is my kingdom, would set up then a statue, an image, an icon. Why was it Nebuchadnezzar wanted to bow the image? Show he's a king, he's a ruler, he reigns. God sets up man in his image. In the image of God, man represents the king who reigns and rules. So where is God reigning and ruling? The earth shall be full of the knowledge of the glory of the Lord. Wherever people are to be found, God is the right ruler, the one who reigns. So in a sense, we feel this kingdom of God reality now, but it will be delayed later. I want to break down for you the first two Beatitudes very carefully, and I want to do it under a quick header real quickly. I believe this part of the Bible, I agree with a Christian brother who wrote a book that he didn't get to see published. He died, and then it was published, named Jerry Bridges. He's an old gentleman. Uh, he lived through the Great Depression as a young boy, died in 2016. And if you get a hold of any Jerry Bridges book, you will inevitably be helped, I believe. He's a great communicator of biblical truth. But he said that he believes that the Beatitudes are a portrait of Christian humility in action. Humility. You know that humility is the second most mentioned characteristic of Christians in the New Testament. Can you guess what the first characteristic of Christians would be? They will know that you are my disciples when you have love. Love is number one. Humility is number two. Love finds about 50 mentions, directly or indirectly, of believers in the New Testament. Humility takes about 40. So it's not far behind. You can think of Christianity as being like a house, and we're in a church house today. And so we have walls, we have some rooms. This is, of course, our largest. We have our roof and the rafters and everything that makes this place beautiful. And if you think of living a Christian life like building a home, Think of the very ground you stand on as the love and humility, and without that, we'd be falling through the floor. Doesn't matter how pretty the rest of it is. Doesn't matter how educated we are. Doesn't matter how rich and giving we are. Doesn't matter, you know, like Paul said, I can speak in the tongue of men's and angels, and if I have not love, I'm just the noisy gong or a tiny symbol. If I know all the prophecies and can interpret all the mysteries, if I have all faith so as to move mountains that have not love, I am as nothing. So love is at the foundation. Humility is close beside it. Because without true, with true love comes humility. Humility is that being able to not put yourself first and to take the stance and the mindset of serve. And to imagine the good that you might do for someone and do it. Humility. So what do we do with this? Jesus begins, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Well, that's where he starts, so let's consider it. Paul called himself the chief of sinners. Remember that? 1 Timothy 1.15. The saying is trustworthy, and you should fully accept it. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief and foremost. Paul had a mindset that was poor in spirit. When Jesus says, blessed are the poor in spirit, he is speaking of people who in their inner life, where they would begin to relate to God by faith. Understand this to be true. I bring to God absolute need. God gives me what I need. I don't bring to God things that I can lay on the altar of my life and say, you're welcome, Lord. I've done so great. Aren't you proud? Rather, what it is, as Paul would say, by the grace of God, I am what I am. You know, the Bible commands us to put forth effort, to take action, and to take responsibility, and to live a life, and to give an account. And then at the end of the day, it says, any good that we have comes from the one who's above, comes from the Father of lights, who never changes. So at the end of the day, the best of men and women you've known, when you're thankful for them, and you're hugging them, and you're loving them, give thanks to God. He's poured into this life. He's poured into this person. When Jesus gets into this thing of being poor in spirit in a peculiar way, I'm going to give you a little bit of Greek, not to try to make you think I know something, but I just happen to know something. The Greek word used here is one of two. The one not used speaks of someone who's just basically a day laborer, has to work every day, but what he or she needs. In other words, has no assets to fall back on. When 
Times get tough, can't fall back on an investment. Can't call up a, a pension or anything like that. A day laborer, somebody who's never going to retire and going to work till the day they die. But still has food on the plate, still has clothes on the back, still can take care of what you need. And that person is referred to as an autodiakonos in other Greek writing, and a self-servant, one who has to serve himself. Doesn't have a servant, doesn't have any bond servants in the house, doesn't have no maid to others. Got to take care of it all on your own. If you're sitting there saying, hey, that kind of defines me, I don't know. If you got any assets to fall back on, you're out of that category. The word Jesus uses in Matthew 5, 3 means absolutely empty. Has nothing. Like Lazarus in the parable placed at the gate of the rich man. Can't help yourself. Weak. Destitute. The financial ledger is totally blank. And so these are the true poor. These are those for whom circumstances have found them to be totally helpless. Jesus is saying, blessed are the destitute in spirit. You know the scripture says that our righteous deeds are like filthy rags before God. It says that there are hidden faults. David would pray, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me, know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any wickedness in me. Because he knows I can't see it all. The scripture dignifies human beings as being the most valuable thing God ever did create. We are glorious. We're also a tragedy. Because in our fall from God and our collective choice that has trickled down through the generations to say, I will be Lord, not the Lord, we wind up being the king spiritually. It's like a little old drummer boy song we see at Christmas, I have no gift to bring to set before the king. What I find to be most compelling to illustrate this is actually in Luke 18, and you can just hear this. Jesus told a parable to those who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. Easy thing to understand. I'm better than all the other people, and they ain't going to get nothing from God because they ain't no good, and I'm good. That's what he's talking about. He said, two men went up to the temple to pray. One a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. You should cheer for the Pharisee and boo the tax collector in those days. The Pharisee is the patriot. He's the leader of the country. The tax collector is the traitor, the one who gouges you and dollars you to death. But the Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus. He said, God, I thank you that I am not like other men. I'll list a few extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even that guy, the tax collector. Here he goes. He's going to tell you about his devotion a lot. I fast twice a week. I get tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector, standing far off, you can imagine he took the most uncomfortable seat in the church. Would not even lift up his eyes to heaven. But he beat his breast and said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Like Paul, I'm the chief. I tell you, that man went down to his house justified rather than the other. In other words, the kingdom was open to him. The kingdom was open to him. Because in God's economy, for everyone who exalts himself, who elevates himself, who makes his own way toward God, who is building his own little tower of battle personally, gets humble. You know the worst kind of humbling you can get? It's all the outer darkness. Very hell itself. This uncomfortable doctrine in the whole Bible. Any church goers put it out of their mind that there could be anything for humanity after the grave except good things. Jesus warns. He says that there will be eternal destruction. He says there will be separation of wheat from chaff and sheep from goats. And the path to salvation is to say not in me all from you, God. That's the path. So that's the best way I know to illustrate it from Matthew chapter 5. Jesus said, blessed are those who are spiritually empty, they're poor in spirit. Now, could he be speaking of people who are just poor? Okay. God has a special place in his heart, and there's a certain there's a certain road often to trusting in Christ that can come with being particularly poor. 
Jesus did say that the rich will enter through the kingdom of heaven only by a miracle because the camel goes easier through the eye of the needle. And he wasn't talking about rich in terms of what's in your mind. He was talking about the literal rich. Paul did say that the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Getting hung up on that, you can run off and pierce yourself with many pangs, is the words that he said. He said you can start to inflict self-harm by your life's goal being more and more and more. And we know how. You have to start to cut corners ethically. You have to start to make shady deals in the back room. Or like so many young men in our city, you push fentanyl or pot. So we can understand the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Even if you kid it all honestly, and your satisfaction and your joy and your happiness is dependent on the cash flow, then you have displaced your worship from God to things. So Jesus has a nugget of truth in Luke's gospel on this because he speaks of the poor there. But Jesus also said the poor you will always have with you. And quite frankly, friends, if, if the goal of this verse in the Bible was to get us to say, I'd rather be poor so I can be blessed, and you want to liquidate their assets, um, you're not going to have anything to share with anybody. Those who depend on you are going to be lacking what they need. So the kind of poverty that you see when you go off to the poorest country in the world, or in the Africa, or one of the poorest countries over here, Haiti, or down in Central America, or in the slums of India. That's not the thing Jesus is saying is blessed. What Jesus is saying, if you think about it, the tax collector was probably like Zacchaeus, capable of giving away a whole lot of money at that point. Because he most likely was an extortioner, cheater, crook. He was a villain in terms of ethics, in terms of loving my neighbor. But it was when he emptied himself, not beginning with his pocketbook, but beginning with his heart and said, God, it's the mercy that I want. Do you think that changed his life? Do you think he did his job honestly after that? Have he found a different job? He had to change it. Because he became a kingdom citizen. And when you are in the kingdom, you say, his rule, his way, where do I go now? We move on to blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are those who mourn. This is closely tied to the first. Now here, it doesn't say, blessed are those who mourn in spirit. It just says mourning, for they shall be comforted. Again, just like the word for poor is the harshest Greek word for poor, this is the most severe Greek word for mourning. This is tragic news that drives you to hysterical weeping that you can't control. That's what this is. This, this is total loss, and the only thing I know to do now is break down. That's what this is. Some of you in this room have known that. Hard to shake it. But he says they shall be comforted. And so let's consider this one together. Jesus would have us to mourn over some things. What he would have us, I think, to mourn over them. And we can learn today to be things that bring us back to him. You know Isaiah, when he, Donald preached from Isaiah 6, and Isaiah sees this vision of God lifted high. It's glorious thing. It's heaven wide open. And there's his robe filling this temple. It's a sight like no other. And he's got the angels around. Holy, holy, holy. Is what they proclaim. All earth is full of the glory of the Lord, they proclaim. And Isaiah, he begins to break down. <laughs> he uses a word that you would use when you are grieving. Woe is me. And it's this thing. He shows that he's poor in spirit. He says, I'm undone. I'm a man of unclean lips. I live among people of unclean lips. I'll give you two things based on that correlation that I want you to think about. Do we mourn over sin? And do we mourn over the state of those around us in that same way? A preacher named Leonard Raven Hill. I believe it was him and said he had a tear stained corner in his office in the Union Fragrance Church. He thought about what they went through and things that he was hearing. And 
urgent needs and stuff he just wanted to bring to God. He got so deep in prayer and so profoundly moved in the spirit of God. I think a lot of times in our country when we go about mourning, we then come up and mourn for other people who are in a bad way. Well, let me ask you this. Did, did shooting in your volume touch your heart? 9-11? We're going to have that anniversary in one week. About the teenage crisis of emotional and mental well-being. I'm not often going to recommend that you do something for the New York Times, but through another Christian resource, I was pointed to coverage they had of that crisis. And it said that 13% of surveyed young people reported a major depressive episode in the last couple of years. Oh, that's also the most unreligious generation of Americans. That's also a generation of Americans who have been told, we're not really sure what you are based on the first glance, and you shouldn't be either. So life is one big canvas for you to experiment. There's nothing wrong with a kid being artistic or expressive or creative or different. Okay? We had a lot of homeschoolers where I was last. Different. Public schoolers are starting now. Now it's more like the homeschoolers I grew up with. It's kind of going backwards. The homeschoolers are acting like public schoolers, and the public schoolers kind of don't know how to talk to humans. But the homeschoolers can lead the charge and teach us all how to speak. Like this. I've seen weird kids. You know, you get a kid, you know how they are. They wear all black, and it's like they're not really Johnny Cash, but they might have a tattoo already that says, like, you know, they got a tattoo on their wrist that's like dark is cool or. And if it's interesting, if you're to think, what is this? But you know, kids get on these weird kicks. It's momentary. But I'm going to tell you something. Something's happening when we're be young. That alone calls you more the generation that you have to. When pediatric visits are more about anxiety and depression than about, I got sniffles, I got fever, I need some minutes. We've tipped over another time quick. Do we mourn for the lack of trust in communities? Do we mourn because institutions that formed culture have been deteriorating in terms of their public trust? And really, in terms of that, there can be good reasons for it. Again, do we mourn because the deep things of God are regarded as inconvenient in our busy lives? Do we mourn because Pornography is rampant and everywhere. Do we do that? And then that's just that's just for people out there. Maybe some of those apply to us personally. So do we mourn over our own sin? Do we weep over our own condition? Like James commanded, cleanse your hands, you sinners, purify your hearts, you double-minded. Weep and mourn. Why? Because in that vulnerable, open, broken-hearted position before God, there He can make a masterpiece out of your life. There he can pick you up and begin to turn you around because it takes coming to that end of yourself to say, I'm done with that. It's broken me, whatever it is. My addiction, my drugs, my codependency, whatever idol I've set up in my soul. So do we mourn over those things? You know, you might, you might read your Bible and say, this sounds kind of contradictory because I'm told in Scripture, rejoice in the Lord always. But yeah, yeah, I'm going to say rejoice. That's in Philippians chapter 1. Philippians has the word rejoice over a dozen times as a command. And so I'm told to rejoice, and yet here Jesus says, blessed if I'm sorrowful. Which is it, Lord? Do you want me to be a celebrating, smiling, happy person? Or do you want me to be like the old monks who are just sorry that it was all going downhill and they had to they had to make a deal out of that. It's kind of like Paul said. Writing to Corinth. He said, we are, we are sorrowful yet always rejoice. There is, just like Jesus could feel, the joy of fellowship with his father. But then he could look out at Jerusalem and he could say, I would have gathered you, but you wouldn't have it. He could look into the tomb of Lazarus and knowing that he was going to call a living man out of that tomb in the next few moments could still be moved to weep at the reality of death. And so sorrowful yet always rejoicing 
is actually a whole lot like Jesus. More so than you might think. Now, Jesus didn't have to be poor in spirit. He didn't have sin. He didn't have, he didn't have anything lacking between him and his own father. He was fully complete. He, he was, he was indwelt. This is God in man from the moment he was conceived. And yet that one's for us. But then when we look at the rest of these Beatitudes, we begin to see mourning and meekness and then desiring righteousness above all, and mercy and a pure heart and a peacemaker and being persecuted. These are actually things Jesus has already laid out and lived already. We're just following in his steps. And so I go where I begin. The kingdom and the comforts of God are for those who admit spiritual need. Says they shall be comforted. What's the greatest comfort you can have when you're sorry for something? I'll give you a few. It's out of your hands, but God will make all things new. You know that? No one is going to overdose in the kingdom of heaven when all is said and done. When I look at the world around me and take stock of the worst of it, I, in my heart, cry out and say, It wasn't meant to be this way. Kids ought to not have to worry about sorry dads walking out on them. Kids ought not to have to worry about shooters in school. Citizens ought not to have to look at their court system or the institutions that are meant to bring justice and wonder what is happening. Citizens ought to be able to function in a duly, duly constituted, rightly set up, safe, liberated society. People ought to ground morality in something outside of themselves because we can't, it's not enough to say this works for me, but not for you. And I look at all that and I say, what does it mean they shall be comforted? One day God will set it all right. But personally, I find discomfort when I am in touch with my own sense of sin, when I, when I feel on the worst side of Jesse Brian Banks, and I look up to the Lord and I say, what help do you have for me? I'm reminded of the cross of Christ. I'm reminded of the resurrection of Jesus. I'm reminded that it's been paid in full. Oh, am I inadequate? He's more than enough. Have I fallen short? God gave the ultimate, perfect lamb to go on his altar for Old Israel would need to find that spotless lamb to pass over and run through the rituals and do all of that. And that was there was some godly divine stuff going on in there. That was a very important symbol for what was to come. There would be a spotless lamb who would go to the cross. And I don't get to paint the blood of the literal lamb over the door close to my house, but his blood is over the proclamation of my life that says, Forgive me clean. So I have that hope. There's comfort in that. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Amen. And how about we take a little personal note on this? When you got folks around you who are mourning, give them a dose of something. Paul said, First Corinthians chapter one. He said that God, or Second Corinthians chapter one, rather, the God of all comfort comforts us in our afflictions, so we may pass comfort along to others who are not us. So pass that on as well. The ultimate comfort is the comfort of Christ and the cross. And if you I've got a man who is my advocate when I'm at my worst. And he doesn't have to and he doesn't have to see me being at my best to love me anymore. Nope. I don't have to put on a show to draw him closer. And he stands at the door or not, ready to always come in and have a little spiritual supper with him. Just open. So do we see now why Jesus might say, Blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are those who mourn. Want the kingdom and you want the comfort? I would challenge you today to do this. If you have found yourself in these verses, maybe you've been walking with God for years, and yet you understand, Lord, I need to be reminded that everything that I need spiritually, eternally, is supplied in you. Even the physical that I need, the very breath I breathe, what I need to please you to be to be able to fellowship with you is already been supplied because that need is called 
grace. And it's co-equivalent is mercy. Grace and mercy. Forgiveness. Maybe you need to go back to that way of thinking. It's been a while. And maybe in the busy and the rush and the good things of life, you might not see some of the things in you that need to change. And so perhaps your morning is taking an inward look to say, Lord, where do you want to go to do your work? And how do I need to repent? What do I need to lay your face on? What do I need to put on? I'm sorry I was sick. Sorry that caused the necessary death of my Savior. I'm glad he was willing to do it. Look at the cross, you know, I'd be sorry that it had to happen to you. I'd be glad that it did. So, pour in spirit and more. That's where we begin. Next week, we'll turn and look at some other of these Beatitudes. I guess every week I'll go through as many as I can fit. Whether that's two or six, we don't know. So, if you, don't, if you want to hear from other scriptures, we'll do that too. We'll be bouncing around our Bible. But why don't you read over Matthew 5? Why don't you say, God, just show me here. Whether there's some growth or some change for me. I guarantee you this. Christians who get a hold of this thing, personally, together, will become a kind of church. You can't help them. 